I'm delighted to be here. And um, I'm particularly delighted to be interviewed tonight by Beverly because Beverly's an art historian and I'm not an art historian. I'm a biographer of artists. So we have uh, different educations and different ways of looking at things. And so I, the first thing I wanna mention is that for what, three years now, Beverly's been living in France and writing a weekly art blog called Musée Musings, Museum Thoughts, where she goes to all kinds of exhibitions around the uh, city or some, and writes an article on uh, the museum's <clears throat> holdings or an exhibition she's seen or a book she's read or a restaurant you've gone to and they're really good I just read them every week because they're funny and they're full, full of all of her art history references which she brings into the um, content of these articles and so I talked her into giving me a bunch of her cards which have the site for her blog on it and they're out on the table where the books are going to be for sale after the talk and I you know it, I suggest you pick one up it's really a nice a nice uh, experience so thank you Beverly for agreeing to interview me and thank you very much Julia for your kind words and I'm happy to be here and finally have an opportunity to do this so we'll we'll begin in the very beginning I think the first thing we should do is have a look at this book. And um, I'm going to ask you how this cover came to happen. Well, um, writers are always having um, unexpected results from both publishers, and in this case, printers, um, because my publisher, I think, was as surprised as I was to discover what Beverly immediately noticed, which was this a really ugly book cover. It's kind of gray green. You can't see the image very well. And uh, the first image on the screen is, the, is a reproduction of the work which belongs to the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, in which the color is true. And even so, the publisher and I went back and forth about what the cover image should be, because this image, in my humble opinion, has nothing to do with the book title, which is Venus Betrayed the Private World of Edouard Vuillard. What did you intend to have as, a, as the cover? Well, um, he said the cover I chose, which I am working towards here, let's see. Yes, there it is, was not a selling cover. Nobody would buy a book with this cover. And I was saying, yeah, but nobody can, it will buy a book about an artist whose name they can't pronounce. It has to have a different title. And so I tried to choose a title that would be intriguing and mysterious because Ria's work is in fact intriguing and mysterious. And this is an example of the title, because as you may see, I've got the arrow on just between her breasts, uh, is it features a statue of the Venus de Milo, the Venus of Milo, which is the um, statue in the Louvre, which you've all seen. Ria in 1904 actually purchased a plaster cast of the torso of the Venus de Milo, and because he was um, obsessive compulsive, I would say, OCD as we say in America, he never got rid of anything. In addition to all the sketches he ever did in his life and his letters and his paid bills and his diaries, this is great for a biographer, but he never got rid of this statue either. And he moved numerous times between 1904 and when he died in 1940. And every time he moved, he took the statue with him. And the statue is very inconvenient. It's much too big to put anywhere in a normal apartment. And so he would just park it on the mantle. 
but this painting explains that there's something very ambiguous going on here. Is Venus betraying Vuya, the artist? She's the goddess of beauty and the goddess of love. Well, certainly in terms of his love life, I'd say she betrayed him, but that this is probably not the issue in this painting. In this painting, I feel as if Vuya has betrayed Venus, and I'm sure you agree with me. Well, I know that this is a painting which shows unbelievably the artist's mother as supplicant. An artist of 60 some years has um, his mother in front of him. He did something with his foot, which is why he wasn't perhaps why he wasn't lighting the fire himself. But there she is, and that may be what she's doing. But in fact, what you're looking at is an old, in her 80s, so I guess we'll just say older woman, um, lighting on her knees in front of this statue. And the fact of the matter is that I see it as a, as a, as a cruel joke. Maybe her son didn't intend it as such, but this is a bit of a backstory. This was a woman whose own mother um, got pregnant with a guy she loved, but who was not acceptable to her father. And this woman's mother, who is this woman's mother, that is to say the grandmother of Vuillard, did something very clever. She was with this guy and they had a baby. And um, after her father died, because her father said, if there's going to be an inheritance, it's, it's not going to be you with married to this guy. So she had a baby out of wedlock, had waited till her father died. Then um, she married this guy. So you would think, think that very cleverly she had, every, had done everything she needed to do, except that um, this young girl who became Vuillard's mother um, had this stain on her life and always felt as if she was the bastard, always felt that that was never going to happen to any, anything to her life in the future. So in fact, what happened was she waited a while, a long while, Till she got married, got married to somebody she didn't particularly know and certainly wasn't in love with. It had nothing to do with passion as it had been for her mother. Had three kids and her overriding goal in life uh, was to avoid shame. And shame for her meant sexual indiscretion. And sexual, the goddess of sex, the goddess of love is certainly nobody she would have been, she would have been a supplicant in front of. So I see it as a cruel joke, even if Julia tells me it's not. Well, I don't think Vuillard was entirely conscious of a lot of things that go on in his work. And we'll have a number of examples in which uh, sometimes Vuillard uses symbolism intentionally. He had done sets for um, um, the theater of symbolism when it was popular in Paris in the 1890s. But in his diary, writing about this painting, he, his diary is, of course, a font of information. So I, I get to find out all kinds of things about what he thought was going on. He never mentions the statue of Venus. He just talks about how much he loves his mother and how loyal she is and how much she helps him. And I'm like, <laughs> you know, but to anybody who looks at the painting who doesn't know what he was thinking, it looks as if he's really trying to humiliate her, or at least to point out the contrast between a work of art, which like a painting or a statue is frozen in time, and the real model who of course keeps on getting older. Well, she's pretty old here. <laughs> and here's a photograph of Via, who since the portrait on the cover has also gotten older, sitting in his living room with the statue who's looking kind of dusty, but she hasn't got any wrinkles. Do <laughs> um, you want to talk about well, this one? Well, what's interesting, this is, um, from what I understand, is of, of what, well, here's the thing with her two, so she had three kids, the old Vuillard's mother, the eldest son went off and he was a naval uh, officer and he seemed to have escaped a lot of very unfortunate stuff that went on with um, her and her two kids, the two, the daughter and the son. And we'll be talking about the son, uh, this daughter um, um, in a bit. Um, but um, Vuillard was told 
um, he could do anything he wanted, but get an unmarried woman pregnant because that would just ruin his life. So he had a series of mistresses, all of whom were delightfully unavailable. And um, this was one of them. Yeah. And apparently, and also remember, I said we all never got rid of anything. He also never got rid of anybody. And so all the people he'd known in his lifetime pretty much continued to be part of his life until they died, which I think is very interesting. And this is one of his former mistresses, who was also a painter. And he may have had a lot of ambivalent feelings about that, too. And she apparently asked him when she was in her 50s to paint her portrait. And we decided she must be looking at herself in the mirror because we know the statue was on the mantle. And she looks kind of as if she's happy with that. But we, the uh, beholders, immediately notice that she doesn't stand up too well against the statue. Well, as we're looking at it, she seems to think, um, you know, she's sucking in her gut. <laughs> she seems she seems to think that she's doing all she needs to do and she's doing fine. But I just that just the way in which her her face is the inversion of the breast and her little nose is the inversion of the nipple. It just all seems interestingly interesting, an interesting juxtaposition of two figures. Yeah. But anyway, I just I thought it was important to show you two of the Venus betraying real people images because he does it constantly. There are at least 10 paintings of this sort with different women. Uh, um, and so you've already talked about Vuillard's mother. Um, a little background on this is useful. There were three children, but the ones who stayed home were Vuillard, the youngest, and his sister Mimi, Marie, named after the Virgin, as her mother was named after the Virgin. <laughs> and the whole issue of illegitimate children hovers over the children. So Vuillard was forbidden to hang out with his mother's employees. Uh, Vuillard's sister was not under any circumstances to get into trouble. And Maman became as you notice, she's much stronger and more bulky here. She wasn't a very big woman, but Vuillard draws her as a really big, heavy duty, strong force. And this, you'll see in other examples of it. And so he had, uh, she had these two children at home wh whom she was fiercely protecting. And the way she handled it with Vuillard, of course, Midi immediately led him to go out and fall in love with one of the seamstresses and more about that later. But the, ske the sketch on the left, I'm uh, putting the arrow on it and then I need to put the arrow off of it so you can see it again, is what we are called an image mère, a mother image, not because it was of his mother, but because there's an idée mère in French, the, the sort of seminal idea we would say in English. And this is the image mail, the seminal image for, a, um, and it became a habit for Vuillard. He'd make little sketches of scenes he observed. Here it's his mother and his sister probably washing dishes. And then he would use these images, sometimes years later in another work of art, and he wouldn't make them identical. He would sort of move them around and have them suit his purposes. But it's remarkable how themes appear over and over in his works. And the, the theme of Maman and Mimi not getting along too well and sort of in, in, in the watercolor on the right, they've got their backs turned to each other. And you know, that sort of like, Mimi looks a little mad and she's got a skillet in her hand and we're not quite sure what she's gonna do. Well, I think it. she knows what she'd like to do with it. <laughs> yeah. And my mom is doing something unclear, but we will move on to that now. But um, this is, uh, Bria said, I always work from memory. I never make anything up. And we know virtually everything he, Every person he portrays in his work is somebody he actually knew. Sometimes they were patrons who were painting for portraits, but he knew them. So this, this, his work is always autobiographical in that sense. And these, these little images, the one we just saw and the one we're looking at now, are sketches they, or private 
works. They were never, they were not commissioned and they were never going to be shown. He was addicted to painting. That was the one thing that soothed him. He didn't, didn't do drugs or painting was his, was his drug. And um, it's what kept him going, what kept him, I guess, as sane as he was. Yes, he started, his father died when he was 15. And I think for any 15 year old boy, losing a father is traumatic. And he got very depressed and he lost his faith in God and he was really unhappy and then discovered suddenly that if he did art, he had art classes in high school. He went to a wonderful high school called the Lycée Condorcet. And the friends he made in high school became his lifelong friends, who you know. And, uh, and he discovered that drawing made him happy. It was not the, the finished drawing, it was the act of mm -hmm. doing art. Mm -hmm. And he concentrated on a line or a shadow or getting a shape right. And he would forget about being so unhappy. It was like he entered another world. Right. And he drew daily all his life. And many, many of his works were never shown. During his life. Private yeah. works. Mm -hmm. And they only were discovered in a studio after he died. Well, this, no. Oh, do you want to go back to yeah. that one? Because, well, what oh, right, was, we forgot right, to talk about. Right. What Sorry. was interesting to me about the previous uh, image that he created, and it's about the same time, is that they, the, two, the mother and the daughter seem more or less equal. I mean, they each have a weapon in their hand, and they can each do equal damage. But this image looks as if it's quite clear that that Mimi is on the defensive. Uh, I, the, the mother has become sturdier, square. She's got uh, something in her hand that looks like a knife. And uh, Mimi um, is in the, back, in the back there um, like a puppet. And as Julia mentions in the book, um, uh, Vuillard worked in puppet theater. But we know that puppets, the puppet master has to keep the, the string on. You don't want to detach it. And yet the way that, that he has depicted Mimi here, uh, Mama looks much more like a butcher to me. And uh, <laughs> there seems to be trouble afoot for dear Mimi, who's getting weaker and less, less independent as a person. Or may already have been slaughtered. What do we uh, know? Yeah. Mm. Anyway, these works reappear. There are series of these works about the competition between Mama, who wants to run the show, and her daughter, whom she wants to dominate, I think in part to keep her out of trouble. Maman was a corset maker. I mean, you know, corsets are very ambiguous garments because they're, all, they're very lacy and frilly and covered with bows, but they're only seen when the woman takes off her clothes. Whereas respectable bourgeois women wore corsets, which made them stand up straight and kept them tightly laced. And, um, were very hard to get on again if you happen to take one off. Well, you needed, home. I mean, you, you needed, needed somebody else. Yes, <laughs> right. This is not an independent job, right. right. Yeah. Anyway, all of this is to say that my mom tried to kind of bully Mimi into not being sexy. Mimi loves to make herself beautiful clothes. And my mom pretty much just tried to dominate her. And one thing the way I think we haven't mentioned yet is that um, Mimi, was away at school from the age of 10 to 21. And she was at school, she was at a school, boarding school um, with other young girls and eventually young women. Um, although it was a free school, um, most of the people, most of the young women who were there were, um, were the daughters of wealthy uh, people who were probably were leaving probably at the age of 15 or 16 to be married or certainly, you know, put on show. And Mimi um, was, or had to, was forced to whatever, cho I can't imagine, she made the choice. She stayed until she had to leave at 21. And there at 21, she came home. And however awful it could have been at boarding school, those were, those were her family. And here she came home to a mother who just refused to let her have any kind of a life. I just find it so frightening that 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 she would dominate this girl and you see her and you see look at this look at maman she's looking at us she's confronting whoever it is is confronting her as this young woman tries to either slide into um the wallpaper 
or doesn't know whether she wants to come out of it yet. And so it's she. It look. It really looks as if she's trying to do a disappearing act. Yeah. And so let's go to a different kind of painting. This is a public painting. This is Ria's first very important painting commission, which was arranged for him by a friend who became his art patron, one of his first art patrons, and who had gone to the Lycée Condorcet with him, a man named Tade Natanson, whom we'll talk about a little more later. And Tade convinced his cousin to hire Ria to do a series of decorative paintings for his living room. And Vuillard had a problem because he paints from memory, he paints about the things he cares about, the places he's been, the things he's seen. And this one was based on his mother's corset factory, but it had to sit in the living room of somebody he hardly knew. And you can't really paint a lot of half naked women running around trying on corsets. Not for living and room. And hang it yeah. in your living right. in somebody's living right. room who doesn't necessarily know anything about him. And so he thought it over and decided he had to he could use whatever he wanted to, but it had to be beautiful. And so, well, you, you know, as I'm looking at your image and I'm looking at this, you need to look at the one in the book because the colors are much sharper. It's much more beautiful. And um, well, Julia, it, Julia's idea, which seems, which makes a lot of sense, of course, is a young boy, a young man in a corset factory has to disappear. It's, you have to be sort of, it has to be more disappearing than a eunuch. You have to be not there when all of these women are running around um, half undressed getting corseted up or corseted out so um so there we're looking at we're being these are being these women are being seen with bolts of fabric in front of them um, and they all are just beautifully if you can count their faces they're hiding or being hidden by the by the the, the gorgeous bolts of fabric that are in front of them you can make out their faces and it really is like the thumb fleur of um of of the time and it's just beautiful and they all fade also into the um into the wallpaper it's just gorgeous and then um well julia's contention is that um that the well do you want to tell them what your contention and then i'll yeah, tell them what mine is oh, okay yeah <laughs> we we have two different ideas about how to interpret this work and of course he didn't say so you know i just make this stuff up <laughs> Me too. <laughs> um, anyway, um, first, uh, first of all, I, I forgot to mention that the what I call the corset factory was a kind of a cottage industry that his mother started because they didn't have any money after, and particularly after the father died, his pensions were taken away. And they, well, Ria as a teenager commented in his journal that he was hungry. He was faint from hunger. So life was really difficult there. And the cottage industry was in the dining room. And so there was really only one major room in the house. And we all slept behind a screen in the dining room. And then when the ladies came over, they cleaned off the breakfast dishes and opened up the bolts of cloth. And the women who were undressing would ducked behind his screen and he literally had no place to be and so he became invisible and here he's of course invisible because he's the painter but he's made the women invisible too except for two women one is in red she's the one i'm showing with the arrow and she's obviously the seamstress who is coarse featured red faced uh, and looks very unhappy unlike the, the beautiful women buying corsets. The other person in red is far left is a baby, a child. And he seems to be leaving the room with a slender woman and a black shirt and a white skirt. And remember I mentioned Vio is under complete uh, interdiction of getting involved with his mother's seamstresses. And of course he did anyway. And the one he fell in love with got pregnant. At which point there was a real decision that he made because either he married this perhaps even illiterate, certainly impoverished young woman who had probably come in from a slum on the outskirts of the city or maybe from the country. 
and he could either marry her and give up his career as an artist and art was really the only thing he ever wanted to do because he'd have to get a job or he could dump her and he dumped her. He just abandoned her and she went back to Marseille and presumably had the baby and he never saw her again. But what's interesting, because this is several years later, that happened in about 1888, he feels so guilty about it. He feels so uneasy. She keeps turning up in his art. And I thought that was interesting. Right. And you have right. another theory, which well, is also interesting. Well, thank you. I, I think that, that the, the idea of the life he'd never have of leaving, or, or the woman leaving through the door, is certainly one way to read it. I see it also as the possibility that that's his sister, the one in red, sitting there. And she's with uh, a plain color color fabric you can see and um so she is doing she is making a corset and she has her back turned to the door she's not escaping at all she's on this side of the work as the woman um who wishes and can escape does walks out so um yeah both are true yeah both are true and and we do know that we uh was deeply engaged with both his mother and his sister neither of whom he could marry of course <laughs> <laughs> worked out fine yeah uh and here is mimi escaped um, she has escaped at least for the time being um because his best friend um voyeur's best friend has uh proposed marriage which sounds terrific doesn't it except that he was six years younger. He was much wealthier. He had a girlfriend slash mistress already, a lovely woman of his own station. And he only married Mimi because um, she had asked her brother to stop bringing this guy home. He, she had fallen in love with him, but how could she not have fallen in love with the only guy that ever came into the house? I don't really see <laughs> what her choices were. But here she is, she's, she's getting married. And we see her from the back. Um, we see a, a beautiful young woman standing up. And now we know that it's the wallpaper from which you come because that's her betrothed. That's her, that's the guy, Care. His, um, yeah, his name was Francois-Xavier Roussel, but um, his nickname was Care. So we yeah. just call him care. Yeah, he doesn't. Well, as you'll see, he doesn't, doesn't deserve care. better. No, he doesn't <laughs> care and he doesn't deserve any better. But anyhow, we just see she's been removed from the responsibilities of the of the corset shop. Um, somebody else is doing that work. Somebody else who's dressed in um, in very somber clothes and working with plain, plain um, material. So and th now this one was also not intended a private, private painting. So you see that the private paintings go from being mere sketches to being something as elaborate and as well finished as this. And now we move on. Anyway, yeah. 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 So it at first it looked like a deal. You know, Mimi got to get married and get away from Maman. Uh, Care. Uh, the story is that when Care was told he shouldn't come to the house anymore because Mimi was in love with him, said, "Oh, Mimi's in love with me, and that well, then I'll marry her." But it never made any sense because he was Edouard's friend. He wasn't Mimi's friend. And he already had a mistress and whatever. And of course, the best laid plans of mice and men often go astray. And you can't say this looks like a painting of a happy marriage. They, they moved, he moved in. They didn't move out. All oh, right. He was supposed to be rich, but somehow they didn't, he didn't have any money. And he never got a job either. Well, of course not. Uh, but the, just the idea that 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 and now they're living there. And so whatever, in a tiny apartment and whatever sounds that a oh, I just can't even imagine just awful. And there she is looking either under the bed to hide under it or to, I don't know, escape from it. But it's one of those sketches that is to me is very evocative that the guy in the in the suit getting ready to go out and see his mistress um, making who knows maybe she has to find his shoes or oh I don't know or maybe she thinks there are monsters under the no. bed but the monster is really this guy uh, anyway so unfortunately this was really a terrible marriage at least for Mimi and I think for Kale Kale was very unstable 
and uh, very self-centered. And as I mentioned, uh, never earned a living. He never took a job. He assumed that Edouard would support him. And Edouard spent his entire life supporting Mimi, um, Care, Maman, uh, Care and Mimi's children. It was not much fun. Uh, this is um, one of those beautiful, beautiful images again for a um, commission. So um, this was, go ahead. Um, well, it's a picture that at first seems totally abstract, but it was a commission for an exhibition mm -hmm. run by Stefan Bing, who did a big Art Nouveau exhibition. And he asked Kev, I mean, oh, sorry, Ria to do, I think there's six paintings in the, in the series. And Ria did what he did before, which was to make beautiful paintings of women, you know, surrounded by flowers. And the expression femme fleur comes up all the time when people talk about this. And there are vases of flowers and there's flowered wallpaper, but, and there are four figure, figures, but only two of them are, whoops, sorry, I went the wrong way. Let me go back. Um, and one of them, the one on the uh, far right, really looks kind of like Mimi. She's sort of gray and sad and dull looking and slumped. The other figure on the right side of the painting is the mistress. I mean, th these are symbolic fig figures. They don't look like recognizable people, except that we know that the mistress had red hair, and we know that Kea continued to see the mistress after he was married. And in fact, the issue of pregnancy really comes up here because uh, Kea and Mimi had been married about three years at this time, and Mimi had 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 a miscarriage, she had had a stillbirth, and then she had a third child who died after just a few months. And each time she got pregnant, Cam moved in with the mistress. I mean, he wasn't a nice guy. Um, so this is a painting again, which is quite beautiful, quite abstract. You wouldn't need to know any of the backstory, but I, as a biographer, really thought the backstory was interesting, and it, it kind of adds to our understanding of the painting and the artist. So, mm. this is just—it's just so beautiful. This one now is from the same series, um, but we're not any more involved or concerned with Mimi's um, biography. We're now with um, Voyard's own biography, his autobiography. And we see here three women. And um, do you see two, right? And if you look in the upper left-hand corner, that's the third one. And um, the, the woman in the foreground is Misia, who was his first love. There was never, it was an unrequited love. She was a terrible flirt and terribly attractive and loved having all of these guys around her. She was, and her husband actually loved her too. So that and was And she fun. was married to Tade Natanson, who mm -hmm. arranged Ria's first commission mm -hmm. and perhaps arranged this one. I don't actually know. And so maybe and, it would have been tacky. a lot of art right. from right. Ria. Right, right. So he was an important, he was important and perhaps he didn't pursue uh, Misia, although what, what could he offer he, her? Tade? Oh, you oh. mean? Tade no, no, no. married Misia, right. no, no, no. he could support her, he right. could afford her. Right. No, um, Edouard couldn't. But mm -hmm. so if in the foreground is this lovely Misia, right behind her is Mama. And so what we're seeing is Misia. Abstracted, now, you know, an abstracted, right. lovely woman. Right. Taking the place of Mama as the most important woman in his life. And again, still behind is that young woman he sent away. So he sort of paints in the women in his life and none of his loves ever work out. No. Um, and I mean, he, finally he gave up on Misia and got involved with another woman who actually was married to a, a gallery owner who sold Ria's work. It was always this, you know, this man who supported the woman Ria could not afford and whom he fell in love with. 
And there was like all this triangular stuff where he was dependent on the husband of the woman he was in love with. But it was fine. This guy didn't, the next one was okay. He didn't, it was one of those marriages. Well, those yeah, marriages. One of those marriages. Anyway, th this is just a oh, yeah. quick aside. There's a postage stamp sized sketch in one of Rial's notebooks, which shows that even this scene was based on something he had observed. You, and the woman in the middle looks more like uh, Maman than the stylized woman in the painting. And there's a figure who's probably female here with a similar posture and flowered wallpaper. But the, uh, the poor seamstress is not in the original sketch. And now we're going to just skip forward because Ria lived too long and did far too much work. And so he, you know, he, he lived right. to be 72 and the incomplete catalog has 1600 pages. But I thought that this painting was useful because it shows that Ria did not change his painting style. There are a lot of accusations over the years that only Ria's early work is interesting. And the work he did later was a sellout, but so he could do portraits because portraits have to look like the person is paying. And this painting is was done in 1919, at, just after the end of World War One, and it was it's a sketch. It's a personal sketch for his own use, and he did it very quickly. But it's in the same style he always used, and he was doing a portrait, a commissioned portrait. Um, by the, uh, the husband of the woman who's shown here, uh, who was a woman he actually knew very well. He'd knew, known her since she was a child. She was the niece of his major mistress, whom he kept for 40 years, whether or not he was faithful to her, I will not go into tonight. But anyway, uh, and so he started painting this, um, painting in the garden, but it immediately became quite abstracted. He painted the face of his model out. If you look at the real painting, you can see that he took a brush and painted her face away because he wanted it to be an idyllic painting, a kind of a symbolic painting, and not one that was a portrait. Then that weekend, which, um, it, the date on this is from the 10th to the 15th of August, 1919. And we know this because we are writes in his journal. And then they went away for the weekend. The August 15th weekend is a long weekend in France. And by the time they got back, there was trouble in the marriage. And Vuillard, who'd been very happy painting this young woman whom he'd known all her life, got really upset. And what happened to him was that he became sort of paralyzed and he couldn't continue the painting and he couldn't do a second version. And he just put the painting away and he wouldn't finish it because he, he couldn't face the fact that this woman was so unhappy and it was clear. He, he wrote in his diary, Edmond, that was her husband, He's enraged. And then he talked about how Edmond was yelling at his wife and being very cruel to her. And he wouldn't finish the painting. But he and, did. Well, 10 months later, I think they confronted him and said, wait a second, you promised us a portrait. And this is what he came up with. It's in a totally different style, very detailed, very meticulous. The whole atmosphere of the painting has changed. It's now kind of yellowed grass and the front, the front third of the painting is dirt. And it seems like a very different scene. And, and you know, it's interesting the way you describe it because for me, I think, okay, so the guy wanted a painting by Vuillard, fair enough. And um, the, they, they divorced. So he admitted to something during this holiday that just so infuriated her, she'd had it. And he still wanted this painting. So he could put it anywhere because this could be the nanny for whoever, for who knows. We know <laughs> it's the wife. He's accepting that the baby is his. The woman in it is looking away. And I see for her a very positive possibility as well because it's light. If she keeps going, it's light. It's not going to be easy because there's a border, a barrier of trees that she's going to be confronting. It's never easy. 
but I, I see this as much more positive than you do. I think she's <laughs> gonna, I think she's getting away. They both admit that it's their kid, so I'm okay with this. Well, what I see is that the thing these two paintings have in common is that um, the woman's name was Madeleine and her nickname was Manon. Manon's face is invisible yeah. in both paintings. Yeah. And I think that the reason she is turned away in the second painting is because a, she doesn't want to face Vuillard, and Vuillard doesn't want to face her unhappiness. And he he really believed that he had to be an, an honest painter. And this gave him a lot of problems when he was doing portraits, because sometimes the people who were paying for the portraits were not people he particularly liked. But in this case, I think he was really grieving over watching this couple the in trouble, the yeah. disintegration yeah. of this couple. Yeah. And and you can tell from, he didn't show her face, but her body language is kind of slumped and, you know, she looks uncomfortable and the baby looks pretty grouchy. The photograph, unfortunately, is not a very good photograph, but it was the best one I could find. But that leads us to another set of images that the final, Our final set of images. Yes, this is the end. <laughs> We're almost done now. You can wake up. <laughs> Or um, not, it's your choice. <laughs> um, Ria, as I think I mentioned, had a, a, a mistress for 40 years who was married to a gallery owner who, who managed his work and sold it. And, um, and this woman, whose name is Lucy Essel, also had her own money. So Ria was home free again. He had somebody who was buying his work and somebody who was supporting his mistress. And, and he was sort of like, what can I say, the hired help. <laughs> On all levels, yeah. And But here, this is the beginning of their love affair. They'd been together for about two years, and they went to the seaside, and he painted this totally lovely picture of this woman in a pink dress with a sea behind her, look, you know, looking dreamy. And uh, it's a charming picture. And what's interesting is that this painting, which was done at the... Um, well, it was done about 20 years later. He, uh, we uh, painted it in 2020, in 1920, sorry. Then he repainted it in 1926. And then he repainted it again in 1935. And then he finally finished it in 1936. That's four years before he died. And during this whole period, she was his mistress. And during this whole period, he struggled with the painting. We know we start, he started it in, um, in 1920 because this is the photograph of um, Lucy Essay's summer place and the garden with its, its flowers, etc. cetera. And uh, you note there are no figures in this painting, I mean, in the photograph, whereas this painting, whoops, every time I do this, I screw up the color. The woman on the uh, far right to me, symbolizes the early Lucy, the Lucy he fell in love with and whom he painted in a pink dress in 1920 and who is young and beautiful and wearing a kind of a pink kimono here and obviously was not in the original photo and who is standing looking out over a sort of balcony into the garden. And I'm going to ask you to follow her gaze as I move the arrow to the the other woman who is hidden in the flowers. Can you see the face of this woman and her body here? This is Lucy in 1920. And we know this because on the same day Riyadh did this photo, he took a photograph of Lucy, who is on the right in this photo, working in her garden. And she's in the same pose approximately and wearing the same hat, which you can see in uh, the painting. But here, her gaze is looking up at the young Lucy. And the young Lucy is sort of staring at the Lucy who was as she was when the painting was painted. And so at the very end, you know, way into his career, and as late as 1936, Vuillard was doing exactly the same thing. He was using memory. He was using his emotions and his feelings to express himself. And he was painting femme fleur. He was painting women surrounded by flowers. 
And I just think that's cool. That's all I have to say. <laughs> I think that's a wonderful way to wind it up. Yeah, thank you, Julia. It's lovely. Thank you. Thank you, Julia and Beverly. So we want to open it up. We have 10, 15 minutes left. Um, if there's any questions here in the audience, we also have almost 90 people watching on Zoom right now. So please, if you're watching online, enter some questions in the chat and we'll try our best to get to them. But let's open it up to questions here in the audience. When I first opened the book, the paintings or the reproductions were so beautiful that I must confess that's all I did. I turned the pages to look at the paintings. But then I realized they were not in chronological order. And so I went back to the table of contents and looked at the titles, which caught my imagination, but left me perplexed. So um, then I began reading page one. I gave up on trying to figure it out. But would you, would you kindly tonight tell us how you put the work together, how you organized it, if you will? A lot of people. Is, am I on? Good. A lot of people, particularly art historians, complain that this book is like a bunch of different pictures, they're not in chronological order, they don't seem to be uh, exp ex explaining a theory of art or anything. And I was, I'll tell you exactly what happened. I don't read art books from cover to cover. I leaf through the pictures. And then when I find a picture I like, I read about it because I want to know about that one. And so I decided I'd write a book I wanted to read. And I pretended that I was walking through a museum with a friend, any one of you. And we were looking, and I know a lot about Ria, and we were looking at the pictures together. And you would stop in front of a picture and say, What do you know about this one? And so then I would write a chapter. And each chapter is kind of like a little story, like the biography of an artwork, if you will. And I would have the chapter begin with the image and then tell everything I could find out about what Via had in mind when he was doing this work, what things were going on in his life, where this theme reappeared because he uses, a, uses the same themes over and over and over. And, um, and anything I knew about it. And because I'm a biographer and not an art historian, and because I'm a failed artist, but we won't go there, I know a lot about how artists think. I know a lot about how artists use materials and feel about drawings and stuff like that. And so this is not an art history book. This is a book about the work of one particular artist who happened to paint people he knew in places he went and who worked in a variety of different ways with different approaches, but how many times a group of images will work together to tell a story. You know, Julie, I, I, can, I understand that. And I do think um, that you may be shortchanging art historians. I think we are um, po probably or maybe capable of, of, um, of looking at your book is a series of independent articles. I think any of these could have and would have been beautifully received um, in an art journal um, because each of them holds together each of the chapters. So you don't have to go chronologically and well, people's lives do go chronologically, which is why we had to organize the this talk chronologically because that's how people's lives go. But each of these, each of your chapters is just a great read independent of the others. So. Well, they're written to be read in any order. So mm -hmm. when you look at the book, riffle through, find an image you like. I also well, tried to give the chapters catchy titles. titles. So they have titles like Pregnant Silences. That's the one about Mimi and her mother. Uh, or The Stalker about um, 
adolescent uh, via following women in the streets at night, something he continued to do all his life. Or um, even I can't remember them, but I, I tried to make the, the chapter titles look as if it would be a good read. Right. I, the article that I wrote on Julia's book is in following um, your beautiful lead. It's the title is paintings have patterns and people have problems. <laughs> and it's actually uh, the review has virtually nothing to do with what we've talked about tonight and i highly recommend it i thought it was fascinating i learned all kinds of things from it thanks, thanks. are there any other questions anyone else yes <laughs> Why did I choose Via? Uh, well, very quickly. Um, I my first biography, which my husband discovered it was sitting on the bookshelf in here and has a much better cover, was a biography of Toulouse Lautrec. And my British publisher at the book launch for uh, the Toulouse Lautrec book asked me the same question. He said, Oh, well what's your next book going to be about? And I said, Edouard Ria. And he said, it'll never sell. You know, <laughs> sorry, nobody wants to buy a book about a man whose name they can't pronounce. And, uh, and I had been told a lot of things that turned out not to be true. One was that there had never been a biography of Ria um, because he was so boring. He was actually a very nice man. I mean, I discovered from his art, there was a lot of weird stuff going on, but he was personally really nice. And he was especially nice to women. And he was always kind of very kind to people who were upset or suffering. But they say, yeah, but he's so boring. He lived with his mother until he was 60. And I'm going, any guy who lives with his mother until he's 60 is hiding something. <laughs> and of course, that's when I got into his life. And then that's why I had to give it a different title because probably half of you are French and have no trouble trouble pronouncing Via, but I have a hard time with it. <laughs> we, um, we do have a question similar to that um, here on Zoom. Someone wants to know how Riard would feel if he were sitting in on this lecture today, <laughs> knowing that the audience had been able to spy on his inner psyche. <laughs> Well, I, I think I, I would answer that in two ways. The first, of, uh, the first way is that Ria was an intensely private person, and he really did not share his feelings with people. He, even the things he wrote in his journal are extremely circumspect. For example, he never once mentions his father, who died when he was 15. Not once, not even the name. He did more than 700 paintings of his mother. He never writes anything critical about her. But I'd say at least half of the paintings of his mother are, as we have observed, pretty ambiguous, pretty ambivalent, you know. And so in his art, he expresses a lot of feelings that he wasn't expressing himself. And I think he would, he would be going, I never thought that. What makes you think I thought that? But, you know. There are a lot of things people could tell me I've been thinking and bring up. I felt like a forensic psychologist or something digging around to find things, you know, that I thought I could document. And so I never say anything I haven't really tried to document. But um, I'm sure he wouldn't agree with everything I say, but it doesn't mean that I'm wrong. <laughs> and it certainly doesn't mean that he's right. <laughs> But so I think he was a very private person. And yet I think he would be pleased to know that people love his work so much and that he and that the work they love is not the work he was getting all the money for. He was a really well paid, famous portrait painter uh, between World War One and World War Two. And that isn't the that those are not the works we love. The works we love are the mysterious ones. The ones that, you know, you, you look at it and you go, wow, what's going on there?